Welcome back to the digital walkthrough of the Hatch National Graduate Show 2020. The exhibition features the work of 24 artists, so it takes over the entirety of the Pika Gallery spaces. In the second part of the video, we're going to be exploring the upstairs spaces of the Pika Gallery, so the West End and the landing spaces. So Ella Callender is an artist from Queensland. She has three different works in the exhibition. We'll be focusing on this one, which is called Underrepresented Ordinary. Ella's really interested in these everyday experiences that we never really think about or place any sort of language around. So in the video work, you initially are looking at the sentences on the left-hand side, and they're all sentences and events that we can relate to but you don't initially make the connection between those sentences and these little diagrams that she's drawn on the right-hand side until you look at the key. So the key gives you a method through which to translate these experiences and a formal structure for you to sort of apply language and emotion into these experiences. Um, so you can, see, you can see on the key that each section has different shapes which indicate the frequency, the feeling, and the effect. So the frequency might be, you know, once a month, the feeling might be happiness or anticipation, and the effect might be time and inconvenience. For example, watching someone stretch and almost hit their hand on a ceiling fan happens half a year. Uh, the feeling, the effect is mental, <laughs> and the feeling is anticipation. Um, so by giving you these um, sort of logical and formal structures to place these experiences into, she's really encouraging us to add a weight to them and to sort of analyse them a little bit more, something that happens every day but that we never really think about. So Oni Blue is a New South Wales artist um, and in their work they're exploring their identity as a disabled trans person. So we'll start by talking about the video work, which is called Water Doesn't Tell Me to Lose Weight. So Oni is really influenced by um, speculative fiction and sci-fi. So this video, which was filmed in New South Wales, shows, and filmed from above, shows the artist swimming naked through a lake. You can see that it looks like this really sort of alien landscape and it's not immediately recognisable as something that is here on Earth. So Oni is really interested in this idea of the social model of disability. So rather than putting the onus on a disabled person to navigate their way through a world which doesn't always accommodate them. It's thinking about ways in which there is no such thing as disability when there is a world that accommodates lots of people's different abilities. So Oni uses swimming as an example of this because it's a way for them to navigate a world without experiencing pain in a way that they might experience when not swimming, when walking or when running. Um, so it's, yeah, this really futuristic landscape that's filled with this sort of hope for the future and hope for a different possible world. So their second work here called If the Body Was Open Source is this really beautifully carved plaster bust of a trans person's chest and you can see the scars from a mastectomy on their bust. So it's sort of using this like classical language of like sculptural forms which are used to venerate, you know, gods and warriors and leaders and thinking about why a trans person wouldn't be idolised in a similar way. And you can see from the plaster around the floor that there's this real sort of physical act of like carving out your identity and carving out spaces in which you might feel that you are safe or accepted or ways in which you can make your body really feel like something that belongs to you. So Sian Rogers is a WA artist and their work takes as a starting point their grandfather's business empire which is uh, a cafe called Fast Eddie's which in the 80s and 90s really dominated the Perth scene as one of the only places that was open for 24 hours. A lot of people would go there after going out to pubs and clubs and was like really quite an iconic venue for a lot of people growing up in Perth at that time. But it's also not necessarily about Fast Eddies and their grandfather, but it takes Fast Eddies as an example of a really grand narrative of sort of this 
boom and bust period of Australian history. So Sian's grandfather had, you know, these sort of fake Roman columns in his office. He had this crystal that is um, literally belonged to her grandfather and was um, borrowed from his estate. And, you know, all of these sort of items which signify this amazing amount of wealth that you might have as someone who like owns a business empire. Um, but Sian's background is in clowning and performance. And so you can see that they take these elements of a grand nar narrative and think about ways in which you can slip and fall and you can fail when you least expect it. So you can see this by the banana peels, which are like plaster casts made by the artist, surrounding the crystal in a, a bit of a threat, but also pointing towards the humour that you can find within these tragedies. And I think another way that she really shows this is the burger buns on this sort of fake Roman pedestal. And these are real buns that are sort of slowly shrinking and hardening over time but they're really set up for a fall. So I think by sort of juxtaposing these items of humour and tragedy and these elements of wealth and excess, she's really critiquing this sort of corporate consumer capitalism that dominated the 80s and 90s, but which is really still around today. And so it really critiques our relationship to what we consider to be success and what we think of as failure. So Tina Stefano is an artist, but she's also a vocalist. And a lot of her work is about creating these really beautiful layered poetic spaces that combine visuals with music um, and musical history. So these are two separate works, but she likes to have them shown alongside each other because she feels that they bring out sort of unexpected elements between the two. So in Horsepower, these three horses are elderly retired race horses. And she sees a lot of the figures or the animals or the materials in her work as collaborators rather than objects. So in this work there's the three retired elderly racehorses wearing these really beautiful hoods that have been stitched together made from different resonant objects such as keys and bells. So as they're wearing these objects the horses move of their own volition and create this beautiful shimmering sound through the bush. So the hoods that the horses are wearing reference Tina's grandmother, who worked in a textile factory in Melbourne. So in this way, she's really thinking about age and youth and labour and what happens to us when we're older and we're no longer seen as valuable to a society. So this work is filmed in a factory, which is sort of like a modern cathedral, as she refers to it. Um, so these three men are playing the double bass and the music that they're playing is a medieval chant by a German nun called Hildegard of Bingen. And to many, she's seen as the sort of grandmother of choral music. And as the men play her music, they try to move around the space without colliding into one another. And it becomes a very awkward sort of dance. So she's really commenting on the role of women in classical music and the way that their contributions have been erased and they're literally unable to take up space whereas the men are sort of trying to awkwardly dance around this topic. So as the men move around this modern cathedral, they're literally trying to play the work of a female composer without crashing into each other or taking up too much space, which is really a reflection from Tina on the role of women in classical music and the way that they're often completely erased from history. LAKRM Bruce is an artist who works across multiple identities. Um, so each of the initials of their first name refers to a different identity, which they occupy at different times or sometimes simultaneously. Their work is really focused on centering self-preservation, care and community as a way to challenge these capitalist structures of labour and production and value that push us to constantly produce to make ourselves feel like we have a value and a contribution to society. In a sort of counterpoint to that, they spend a lot of time really methodically, really lovingly and carefully constructing these really small, beautiful, intricate items that are made from textiles, jewels, clay, and then assembling them in a really intuitive manner on the wall in this installation. 
For this exhibition, Alvi wasn't able to come over because they live in New South Wales. So we spent two days on FaceTime with them as they helped us install the work to their specifications. So I think that was a difficult thing for us all to do, but it was something that was created a really nice sort of sense of community within the gallery space as well. So all the textiles were either donated from friends and family, sort of in this gift economy, rather than purchasing new items, or also passed down from the artist's maternal line, so from their grandmother's house, their mother's house, and their childhood clothes. So this um, really gentle methodology provides a safe foundation for them to explore their experiences as a non-binary person and as someone who's experienced um, psychosis due to ill mental health. This digital tour is only a fraction of the artworks that have been included in the Hatched National Graduate Show 2020. So if you'd like to read about any more of the artists included in the exhibition, you can go to the Pika website and download the digital catalogue for free. Thank you again for watching these videos and we hope to see you at Pika sometime in the future.